Welcome to the FMCG Guys podcast. I'm Daniel Torres, joined by Efrain Rosario. Hey, Daniel. Nice to see you again back in Zoom land. Exactly, exactly. It was good to see you at Shop Talk a couple of weeks back uh, for the second time in person. Yeah, yeah. I think we. Uh, it was nice to see a lot of, uh, I guess, somewhat familiar faces from our Zoom interactions with a lot of our prior guests. Yeah, absolutely. So we saw Vina Giridar, we saw... Andrew Pearl, who's going to be on the show soon, as well as the other people that were open to participate on the... Yeah, Christina from Mondelez, we saw... Yeah. They were open to participate in the Shop Talk Live sessions we did there, which was very cool. Well, and I think, uh, like you said, in addition to those live mini sessions that you were able to run, it was great to connect with our guests today, live and in person while we were at Shop Talk too. Yeah, exactly. Our first full-length episode recorded in person. We'll be curious to hear from the audience, by the way, if they have any feedback from it. Hopefully, it makes a better and more entertaining show. And actually, the guest that we spoke with is actually someone very special who I'd invited at the podcast a while ago. And finally, it just coincided that we were able to record it in person. And that's Cemar Kutso, who's the Senior Vice President of Levi's North Europe. Yeah. And it was just really enjoyed our conversation with Lucia, just hearing from her about her journey from a a leadership standpoint, both at Levi's with some of her prior employers as well, but also listening to her just share some of her, her learnings or in essence, like her guidance that she gives to people on her teams now in regards to what she's learned over her career. So just Mm -hmm. really, really enjoyed that on top of talking about one of the, the, the Levi's stores in London in a lot of detail as well. Yeah, absolutely. So since we're, we were in London, especially. So without further ado, here's our conversation with Lucia live from Shop Talk. Hi, this is Daniel here from the FMCG guys, actually recording this face to face from Shop Talk in London uh, with a very special guest, which I've been stalking for a few months <laughs> to get on the show. Uh, Lucia Marcuzzo, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Daniel, for having me. It's a pleasure, really. And to record this live and, you know, in physical presence is it's almost a gift. It's almost a gift, yes. Well, I would say it is a gift. It is a gift. <laughs> it's not almost a gift. It is a gift. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can hear, joined by Efrain Rosario as well, uh, again. It's who's our second time meeting in person. The second time meeting in person. He's flying out to Paris uh, soon, escaping my presence. So uh, he's in a good mood now. Yeah, let's just wait on that. Let's just see how uh, the very travel delays. Yeah, as well, as well, as well. Yeah. Uh, so Lucia, how have you found Shop Talk so far? Well, it's very engaging. First of all, again, being live again in a place where you can meet people, you get new ideas, you get inspired, nice speakers. So I thought it was, you know, really, really great. I think, you know, I was part of a panel on day one and it was something dear to my heart and a bit, maybe not, you know, the hardcore of shop talk, which, you know, it's not about technology and trends and things, but it was leading with purpose, which I really, you know, it's a topic that I love. And then we were actually here in forces with Levi's uh, Strauss because I was here with other three colleagues. And mm. we, we really divided and conquered and, and heard a, a lot of good things. Oh, that's right. Yeah. All in all positive. I think there's a good, uh, positive, optimist spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, and I heard just in speaking to one of the organizers, and they've already confirmed for next year. So oh. mark your dates, June 12th through 14th, uh-huh. back here at Excel. Okay. Oh, well, let's, we can do episode two. We, we can yeah. do, yes, episode two. Yeah, part two. <laughs> exactly. So um, maybe for the audience to get a bit acquainted of, with you, uh, maybe you can tell us a bit of, you know, what you're doing currently at, at Levi's, and then we can, I'm interested to know a bit more about your career, how you got there. And also leading with purpose would be interesting to talk about. Sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. So I'm in Levi's now for 11 years and I I live in Brussels. I moved to work in Levi's originally. I mean, I my career is rooted really in retail and I joined Levi's 11 years ago as head of retail for Europe, large retailer. And then I I actually fell in love with the company and decided, you know, to stay. I'm still still in Levi's today, but I changed already 
a few times through an assignment. I'm today the managing director for North Europe, which is the is the largest business of Levi Strauss outside North America. And this includes, you know, markets like Germany, the UK, Nordics, the Benelux, Eastern Europe. So mm-hmm. pretty large geography. I think it's one of the two regions you have in Europe right now, Yes, right? yes, yes. So Levi's is organized globally with seven regions. So there's two in Europe. One is North Europe that I lead, and the other one is South Europe with mm-hmm. uh, France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Greece, mm-hmm. and North Africa. Ah, there you go. Yes. So, so we're actually in one of your home markets then. We are. Well, I have to tell you that the, uh, the Levi's Strauss store on Marlboro Street is amazing. Oh, that's great to yeah, hear. It's a great experience. We actually were there uh, a couple weeks ago on a uh, oh. inside safari through the Soho neighborhood. Oh, that was our nice. First stop. Nice. Yeah. I love to hear it. It's one of my favorite. I think the teams is very passionate. And, uh, you know, we do special things in London, especially I think, you know, we have we have our archive mm-hmm. as well. So there are some pieces that come from, you know, the archive, a large archive in San Francisco with, you know, pieces that date back, you know, a century. And, uh, and we have a few, you know, rare pieces here as well. And then we have our lot one, which is the made to order jeans. So it's something really customized and fit for you. And, uh, you know, very special experience. We talked a lot during, you know, shop talk about experience Mm. and physical stores and, you know, digital. I mean, I think to me, that's why we visited that store. Because I think it, 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 in essence, exemplifies a lot of those topics, right? Mm. Particularly, I mean, we get into it, leading with purpose as well. Mm. I mean, I think some of the stuff that you see there in terms of uh, how, the fabric pieces yes. are being repurposed. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in so many great ways. Like for me, it was like, oh, you know, this is, I, I have to come back here with more time yes. to properly shop the store. Yeah. And, and the, the made to order section was was mm. really, really mm. fun to watch as well. And, and, and this is an experience as well. I mean, I'm, I'm having actually my lot one prepared these days. I'm, I'm really excited to go and collect my, you know, made for me jeans. And it's amazing. I mean, you, you, come and you select your your fabric your you know all you know the little details of your jeans they made it for i mean this is really you know an an experience you don't forget and as you said i mean leading with purpose levi's one of the things why i really like levi's is is that you know purpose is really ingrained uh, mm-hmm. since the foundation i mean it it was born basically on a very simple idea of putting you know these rivets on on the pants to make them durable and for mm-hmm. for the miners right so to yeah. to put them on top of their of their clothes just to make them more durable and and this idea of durability i mean if you think about it in today's environment with sustainability there's many angles of sustainability but really make make the products you know, resist the time, it's it's one of the most sustainable things we can do. So yeah, and actually that was one of the points I heard that today at Shop Talk as well. There was another panel where they were talking about uh, sustainable brands. Mm-hmm. That was one of the points that the, the you know, one of the, the speakers made, yeah. which is that we have to think about that, right? Which is that you could buy something that's a, a, a pre-loved or I can't remember the exact term that he was using, um, piece, or you could buy something that is new. But it's durable, right? It's going to last you, mm-hmm. you know, close to a lifetime, yes. right? Particularly if you can repair it. Yes. At the Levi's. Yes, yes, yes. We also offer repairs. So it, it, there's a full, I mean, idea behind beyond the experience. And and when you think about it, even from a cost perspective, probably makes sense to spend a hundred euros on, on yeah. some jeans if later they're going to last like. Yes. A lifetime or practically, no? Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. And then usually, I mean, I don't know for you guys, but I mean, for me, jeans, especially the one that you love, that you wear, that really fits your body at yeah. some point, and then they change color over time. So you don't have two pair of jeans that are exactly the same because everybody yeah. wears them in a different way, wash them in a different way and or don't wash them. And, you know, it's unique in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, by the way, how did you how did you start in retail? Because you joined Levi's already as head of retail. Yes. I don't think you started there. No, I didn't start as head of retail at all. So actually, when I graduated in uh, university in economics, and when you know, I always loved mathematics and numbers and you know, 
analytical things and reporting and so so I wanted to work in finance kind of oh, really? I see. so <laughs> that's where I I mean yes especially FPNA I would say so I landed there and then I realized that maybe there were other more exciting things and you know I could not really connect immediately numbers with real things yeah. uh, up to the moment where I was hired in my first retail job in a department store in Italy, mm-hmm. uh, Gruppo Coin, as a merchandise planner, which was a nice way to get into a pure retailer, so department store, really a lot of knowledge. And it was a school, a school of retail for me in a merchandise planning job, which is, you know, in a way merging numbers with product. Yeah. And then in retail, you know, the, the, the big reveal for me was to really see everything coming in, into place because retail is about, you know, a product and people and numbers and space. Hmm. So you have everything in retail, right? It's a super fun industry, very, very fast and, and so on and so forth. So from merchandise planning there, where I really learned a lot, I moved to diesel mm-hmm. uh, and I stayed in diesel for 10 years. I joined as head of merchandise planning. So, okay. Uh, these are very brave. They hired me to set up this merchandise planning yeah, function. Challenge. Yeah, you know, the, the you know, uh, diesel is only the brave, right? And they were very brave to hire me and give me a sort of a, okay, now you do it. So it was a lot of empowerment in, a, in an entrepreneurial kind of reality, big, quite, you know, sizable business, but still with this entrepreneur and charismatic team around and people around. And then, you know, after a few years, setting up the merchandise planning function, setting up tools, I mean, processes and really structuring. It was the years of big development of diesel in retail. Mm. They were made a strategic decision of growing retail. It was all own and operated retail. So well, no franchises. No franchises. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And globally, and then they actually promoted me and they took another, you know, bold decision and brave decision. And from merchandise planning, actually became head of retail globally for diesel, which was a big step. And I had to learn a lot. (laughs) And so, you know, I remember, I mean, oh, oh, how am I doing this? And so I asked my, my boss at that time, so how do I do it? And said, you know, ask questions. And I think it was a, a very good advice. Uh, rather than, you know, think that you know it all, ask questions. And then from there, I, you know, I spent seven years as head of retail in diesel. And at some point, you know, I I had, I wanted a change, a, a life change, really. Yeah. Um, what were you based when you were with diesel? Uh, in north of Italy. Okay. Uh, so the headquarter of diesel is really in Veneto, in the Veneto region uh, okay. and uh, northeast of Italy. So it's a small, tiny village, but very international at the time uh, because, I mean, it was really attracting Mm -hmm. uh, many talents. I wanted a life change after 10 years. I was actually, you know, pregnant and wanted to live abroad. Mm -hmm. So when Levi's came, proposing me to uh, lead retail for Levi's, the global market leader in jeans, out of Brussels, it was ticking a lot of the boxes yeah. and the personal, the challenge, you know. And I thought, you know, oh, what, what better moment than now, you know, I will have a newborn baby. It's, you know, we can move. And my husband, you know, was really supportive. And I, I have to thank him every time I, I have an opportunity like this. I have yeah. to thank him because he was my, my biggest fan and supporter. And we moved to Brussels thinking that, you know, yes, let's go. And uh, and that it started with Levi's. And, and it's a decision I never regretted. So uh, at that time, Levi's was not such in a great shape like today. Okay. It was, you know, we have, we had really a, a period of stagnation after the big boom uh, and, you know, reaching uh, the peak of uh, net revenues at 7 billion, I mean, then it had really, you know, it dropped and half the turnover basically falling to 4.5. And then for many years, it stayed around the $4.5 billion. And when I joined, there was a a huge debt Mm -hmm. publicly traded. So it was not a public company, a family owned company with a 
publicly traded debt, wow. which made it very, you know, uh, financially, you know, driven or let's say there was a lot of attention uh, to, to that tax. Yeah. And why would you go like from like a stable environment some, with people that yeah. you knew in diesel to like a comp and, and a growing company as far no, as you were saying, yeah. like they were growing retail to a company that was like at this, this trouble. Uh, you know, I think, you know, first of all, I, it, I wanted a challenge. Maybe I totally underestimated the fact that you know having a, a newborn baby it's per se yeah. I mean can be a challenge. And I wanted to live abroad and then you know Levi's Levi's is Levi's is like the power of the iconic brand. It's iconic. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean you you wanted to be successful as a brand and I thought in retail I could bring some maybe some ideas and something and you know give my contribution to to revamp it yeah so i mean it sounds like it's been a, a great journey mm. to where you are today what would you say would be some of the big lessons um, yeah. you've learned along the way oh yes oh many so well first of all you uh, the biggest most important lesson is you don't win alone it's the power of the team and people coming together in a positive and productive way. So it has to be positive. It has to be with people that you trust, you, you are well with. So, But if it's only that, then you go out with your friends, right? It has to be positive and productive. So there must be a sort of, a, you know, hunger for results to achieve something, mm -hmm. uh, um, sort of an ambition, but keeping the positiveness, because if it's only about ambition, then, you know, it's not very pleasant and it becomes, you know, just, just competitive for the sake of it. So it's the combination of the two things. So the first thing is really surround you with people that you trust or, you know, you can build trust with and people that can inspire you as well. And, you know, can, you know, they're better than you and, yeah. uh, and let them thrive as much as possible. It's number one lesson and always, and culture is important. So that's why, I mean, I was here at Shop Talk to talk about leading with purpose because I really believe that's the secret sauce you know, you can copy many things. You can mm. copy, you can buy, you can get financial assets, you can buy technology, you cannot copy culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you actually um, transmit that purpose to your team? Mm. Like now to your organization and, and make sure that it arrives to like the store managers and store employees that are like a couple of levels of, well, three or four levels below you. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not a one thing thing because you you need to be. I believe you need to be explicit. And you know, when when I joined Levi's, I I needed to understand what was the brand, what was it standing for, because what you do and what product you have is important, but it doesn't define your culture. Is you know how you do it. So what behaviors yeah, yeah, you totally. have there. And so people will look at you and how you behave and what you do, what you say, but what you do. And so the, the how is super important. So small elements like, you know, how you interact with people, how uh, approachable you are, mm -hmm. uh, if you deliver what you say, if you say what you do. So this kind of transparency communication and, and living up to what you, you preach And then you have to put the investment. I mean, where is your mouth? You need to put your money, right? So you are all about diversity. You need to, you know, invest in creating this diversity. You need to create forum. You need to, you know, take some certain commitments. But then, you know, you have the what you do, the how you do it. And then you need to go back one level even more. And it's a why you do it. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, the, the moment I realized the power of and, and the engagement that I had in the, working with Levi's for Levi's is when I realized that, uh, you know, it, it's more than just a pair of jeans is, is actually is do something that equip generations that want to change the world. I mean, if you if you look at Levi's history, right, it was there for the pioneers, no? so miners and workers, and then it was there for the cowboys, and then was the first 
jeans for women and then it was for the rock stars and then it was for the rebels and the social activists and then for the entrepreneur of the Silicon Valley yeah. changing the world and today is for this you know uh, environmental activist as well so is there I mean if you look at the picture of the Berlin Wall falling down all those people is mm. wearing Levi's jeans oh really because it's freedom right it's 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 always at the epicenter of episodes that are changing the the world and and giving this sense of freedom so for me this is the this is what inspires me behind the brand mm-hmm. uh, so it's the why yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so um given that like you said as you've gone up and you've acquired more responsibility um in your you know, as you've risen up the ranks both at diesel and at levi's how do you feel your leadership style has, has adapted um, you know, as, as again, the number of people that you, you're responsible for has, has grown as well. Yeah, I, I think uh, when I realized that I didn't need to have all the answers, but I had to focus much more on asking the questions was a, a moment for me. I mean, you you grow in your career, probably coming from, you know, a specialized role to a more generalist role. Maybe you go back to specialized and then generalist again. And sometimes you, you tend to overdo, I mean, what you know best, yeah, yeah, which yeah. I still do. I mean, if you ask my merchandise planning team, probably they would tell you <laughs> that I'm a real pain, you know, on merchandise planning. Uh, I, I acknowledge that and I apologize with them. I mean, yes, I know. But I mean, apart from, from this, you know, soft spot that I have for merchandise planning, I mean, the rest is I realized you need to unleash the talent of the people that are working with you, number one. So ask the question, ask powerful questions. And then the other thing is this building trust. And to build trust, you need to show your vulnerability. If you are those superhero that knows it all and, you know, you're not building trust. I, yeah. and, and I have, you know, I have my indicators when I have a new assignment and a new team, Trust doesn't come like because I say, oh, I trust you. No, it doesn't happen this way. I know that the team trusts uh, each other and we have a, a, a trustful relationship when there's people saying publicly in front of others, I didn't understand, I don't agree, Yeah. I have another opinion, ask a difficult question or, you know, when you have those, or I say, you know, I didn't do it and I missed it. I made a mistake. I mean, these are moments where you see that there is trust in the team. Up to this moment, you know, you cannot build anything if you don't have this yeah, but first it's, base. It's a contrary of the of a culture of uh, fear and, and circles of silence, which is like extremely toxic. Perhaps. Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, but you have to live by you know, <laughs> you, can, you, yeah, you, yeah, cannot, right. you cannot make you, it up. You cannot just say it. No, no and then you, have you have to roll up. Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you have to almost like, in, in this situation, yeah. almost like be the change you want to see. Yeah. Right. Indeed. From, Indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, I was curious to know as well, you mentioned that when you, when you joined Levi's, you were pregnant or you just. Um, I just delivered. So my child at that time was four months and we moved to Brussels. So. Uh, me and my husband with a newborn, four months old uh, child, something my, my mom will never forgive me, <laughs> or I mean, move. So it was a new experience in a new seat, in a new company. A lot of change at the same a time. A lot of change at the same time. We, That's what I recommend candidates not to do. No, <laughs> exactly. people in my I mean, it's not tough. To do. It's, I mean, I really, I was very naive. You were very brave. Yeah, very, very yeah. When, after 10 years of only the brave, yeah. I was, yeah, I can <laughs> do this. Uh, but, you know, yeah, especially the lack of sleep was <laughs> the most yeah. challenging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you manage, like, also not only to perform, but also to combine that personal side with the with the work side, uh, that work-life balance, if you like, or a, a work-life integration, as some, as some like to say it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I, I have a rational answer. I mean, mm-hmm. I in a way, I knew it was, you know, I, I, I felt supported. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had a good, you know, support around me. I thought, you know, I was just carry on and trying to do my best. 
and taking it as a learning experience. I mean, in the end, okay, even if it doesn't work, I mean, what can happen? Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. So I think I'm with insight. If I look back, I'm very proud of myself. And this gave me a booster for other kind of challenges, right? Because the more the more you you see that you can handle, I can do. And again, the other thing I had to let go, and it was a great thing for my development, was let go the idea of being perfect. I mean, being good is good enough. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm curious, you know, given again that you've been able to really, through your roles, kind of be exposed to all areas of retail, how have you seen it evolve Hmm. in the last, uh, let's say, 10 years or so? You know, particularly... I guess in light of the last three years of what we've seen both before, during, and after pandemic, but how have you seen the industry itself evolve over those 10 years? Yeah, I think clearly, I mean, there's, I think the fundamentals are, are there. I mean, good retail is successful, bad retail fails. And <laughs> uh, now what is good retail? There's, it's a combination, right? Uh, of, First of all, I think you really need to understand what you stand for. What's your what's your product? What's your sector? What's your consumer? And 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 really be consistent. I yeah. think brands or retailers that are very consistent, they succeed. And there could be other elements. I mean, but but a good successful retail formula, and usually is really be clear about what's your you know. What's your product? What do you stand for? Love and innovate your your core, your DNA. I mean, if you are good at something, I mean, keep investing and bringing innovation in, in your hardcore, right? And then, I mean, location is still relevant. Service is still relevant. I mean, great merchandising amplifies stories rather than trying to, you know, be everything. But I think in general, I mean, of course, digitalization, uh, it's its important and omni-channel. I think these are the, I mean, the two main drivers everybody talk about, but in essence, it's the same. Mm-hmm. I mean, so... Yeah, there's some core fundamentals yes. that, you know, pre, during, post-COVID are, yeah. are always there. Yes. I think the sign of, a, of somebody like you who's successful in retail is somebody who can articulate what are some very simple lessons, but you know, not only state them, but then go and execute them as well. Yeah, indeed. I think you need to to stay close to who you are. So, an example, we were talking about Levi's and, and and durability. At some point, when I joined, we realized that the stores were very transactional, right? So. It was piles of, of jeans and a very masculine, very, yeah. I mean, it was not a pleasant shopping experience. And on top of it, there were many of the frictions that you usually find in, in many retailers. I mean, lack of the right sizes and, you know, um, not adequate coverage of the, of the floors. But anyway, apart from all the things that are common across the board, we wanted to find a differentiation factor that was, you know, how do you know you are in a Levi's store? I mean, imagine, and we did, you know, this blind test, so, sort of imagine to take a consumer, uh, you know, blinded, put him in the stores, and then he opens his eyes and, you know, in five seconds, he should say, I'm this in a Levi's, Levi's store, so. right? So, and so we started rebuilding the shopping experience around, okay, what are the 10 things yeah. that, you know, needs to be absolutely, you know, part of our USP. And and there was a, a huge, you know, uh, investment in refitting the stores, but also extracting those, those elements. And then another thing is, you talk about consumer centricity. Yeah. At that point, we started realizing while I was, you know, you know, come a new job, you start visiting the stores, looking around, and then actually coming to the UK and realizing that they have this sewing machine in, in the back room, you know, and say, okay, why you have a sewing machine? Yeah, because many consumers, we cannot convert if we don't, you know, fit the jeans or, okay. the, or the lens. Because yeah. when you buy a jeans, you have the size of the waist, the fit and the length. Yeah. So it's three things mm-hmm. that needs to, to work. I mean, it's quite complex. Well, and we had these insights and say, okay, why we don't bring this shoeing machine actually 
on the shop floor. Mm. And, you know, this is actually, we train the store staff, so we give them something more than just, you know, you know selling. We, we actually train them and we develop a sort of a tailor shop program. And on top of this, it links perfectly with this idea of durability and a relationship with the product for life. Yeah. Because you can always come back yeah. and get it repaired. So it was something that, you know, ticked yes. all the boxes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? So, and it's, it's just it's such a clear signal to, to a shopper as well, right? You said it, communi- it instantly communicates durability, yeah. personalization, bespoke craftsmanship. I mean, there's, you know, you're kind of ticking, ticking three big boxes yes. just by that small change of where you place the, uh, the tailor. Yeah. And I can tell you that, you know, if having walked around Soho London after going to the Levi store, um, you guys have missed this start a trend because I saw a lot mm. of stores with a tailor front and center. No, oh, well. indeed, indeed, yeah. indeed. But you know, we are already to the next exactly, idea. Exactly, yes. exactly. Yeah, because that was a while ago that you did. So we always ask our, quest, our guests the same question at the end, which is um, if you could talk to yourself at the beginning of your career mm. when you went into banking first and then merchandise planning what type of advice would you give yourself i would say um career is an investment you have to give before you see a return so i mean work hard will pay back however i mean be nice to yourself i mean if it's you know if you make a mistake, if it doesn't come as fast as you wish, I mean, be patient and be nice to yourself. I think, you know, we I grew up um, maybe not in a sort of a growth mindset kind of education mm-hmm. um, where, you know, things were right or wrong. And at school, it's like you are a 10 or a 5. Yeah. Uh, and I think all this mindset is sometimes can go in a way. And I mean, love your successes and embrace your failures with the same gentle attitude and a smile. This was Lucia Marcuzzo, Senior Vice President of Levi's Northern Europe. Very good uh, conversation, no? Overall, Efrain is anticipated at the beginning. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, there's a lot for our audience to uh, to digest in that conversation with Lucia, not least of which is that uh, if you find your way to London, definitely go check out the Levi's Vintage Store and see firsthand a lot of the stuff that, that uh, we were talking about with Lucia in terms of how they've been able to bring good retail to life through that store, which is the first of hopefully many that will come from Levi's uh, around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And what are your main conclusions out of this conversation, Efrain? You know, to me, I think I kind of split it into two big buckets. One is some of the learnings and the insights that Lucia shared about, in essence, how she operates or her guiding principles, if you will. So talking about things like the fact that nobody wins alone and really making sure that she as a leader embodies that mentality, but then also imparts it to her team as well. And really thinking about, you know, focus uh, as to, I was, I thought for me, it was brilliant when she mentioned that, you know, as she advanced in her career and as she became, she, she had more and more leadership responsibilities. She said that, you know, her focus shifted from, let's say, having to answer the questions and more into asking the right questions and then empowering the, her team to go off and answer those for her. So in essence, like that shift from answering to asking a lot of questions from a leadership perspective. And then the second bucket for me was really, in essence, her explanation around what good retail means to her and how she's been able to, in essence, build that uh, within Levi's in terms of knowing what you stand for, being consistent, embracing your DNA. And with a brand like Levi's, there's just a lot there, a lot of really just great material to in essence do those types of things. And then lastly, making the store experience as unique as possible to Levi's given all those things. So like I said, lots for our audience, but also I think for you and me to take away from that discussion. Yeah, it's definitely a conversation worth listening to more than once. Exactly. 
very special experience. So also want to thank Lucia for her predisposition of uh, participating in this, I call it experiment, but I think it was a great experience and a better experience for all of us. So we're looking forward to bringing this type of content more to the table in the future. So thanks for our audience as well. I hope you enjoyed this as much as we did. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Also, of course, a shout out to our friends, Peter and Sri at the CPG guys. By the way, they have a new website where you can even buy their merchandising or their swag as they like to call it. Um, have a great day and we'll see you in the next episode.